Welcome to season six of CX in the Wild with the global voice of CX, Dennis Wakabayashi. Embark on a safari into authentic conversations with emerging CX leaders and brands. The adventure starts now. Okay, let's start out with who you are and what you do. All right, I'm Dave Seaton. I'm the CEO and Principal Consultant at Seaton CX, and we create compelling customer journey maps. Okay, what does that mean you create them? We work with companies to walk through the entire journey mapping process. And so at the end of that process, they have mapped their customer's journey, and they have also gone through some critical change management steps so that they are empathizing with the customer and they're ready to take to act on those insights that they've learned. And do you use a tool for that? Do you sketch them out with post-it notes in your hands or how is that, how it's the process? Uh, ultimately, the, the finished product is created by a graphic designer. Okay. There's a couple of reasons for that. But yes, along the way, um, we use a various amount of digital tools, or if we're doing an in-person workshop, we use the post-its and the sticky notes. And there's a, a lot of a process that goes into that finished, beautiful map or map that map or maps that when executives see it or other employees see it, they say, what is that? And what part of the world are you from? I'm, I'm in the Dallas, Texas area oh. in a city called Grapevine. I'm in Murphy, Texas. Really? Right outside Plano. Yeah. We're yeah, neighbors. I used to live in Wiley. Oh, I, it's all right then. Yeah. That's interesting that you're doing it in a graphic design format because, you know, so many journey mappers have switched over to digital tools to connect the data points mm -hmm. to the journey, and you're not doing that. Why, why is that? You must, you're an expert. There's like a deficiency in these digital journey mapping tools or? So it, a couple reasons. All right. Right. And I'm, I'm familiar with the major tools. Yeah. And if, if that's what the organization needs from a change man management perspective, we can use that right, yeah. to build the living journey maps and, and whatnot. But the reason that what I think is the best solution is that custom designed map is because companies are different, customers are different, journeys are different. And the graphic designer allows us to make a unique visualization that tells that story that when you see it, you want to understand more. And, and that develops the empathy for the customers, understanding what I'm looking at, right, that helps the organization catalyze and act on that. A, an ugly journey map is going to get um, cut short in meetings. It's going to end up in a filing cabinet somewhere and is not going to be compelling. It's not going to catalyze change. And if your journey map is not driving change, it's just an art project. Wow. That's, you know, journey maps are so complicated. You know, my, I started out as a graphic designer myself. So I understand the importance of visualization to convey meaning to an audience. And, you know, I find when I'm doing journey maps in the digital platforms, I often have to break them down into parts and present them in sequence because overwhelmingly, you know, to have a uh, 10 foot by five foot thing is like, Oh, a bunch of squares with text in it is a lot. No executive can yeah. process. It's unfair to yeah. process that much information. So um, talk to us about your origin story. How'd you get into this whole, how'd you get roped into this party? Yeah, so uh, if we go all the way back to the beginning, I was a computer programmer. I was a software engineer. And uh, I was developing back then, we called them graphical user interfaces. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the word user experience and, and all of that. But I started out thinking, how are, how are human beings going to interface with this software and what makes the most sense? Along the way, I 
I discovered about myself, it wasn't banging out code that I was really excited about. It was solving problems. And kind of that self-realization, that epiphany opened me up to exploring other career options. And I, I threw my hat in the ring as the manager of a new customer service team, kind of a tier three engineering support in the B2B software world. And uh, that, was, that was a huge career change. And I had, to, I had to learn and grow and learn leadership and emotional intelligence and everything. And As a programmer? Yeah. No, yeah. I'm, I'm joking with you, but yeah. <laughs> well, it, you know, I, I, was, I was a really good engineer, and so they made me the manager. And I, I didn't realize at the time I was naive. I didn't realize that I had just changed careers from engineering into, into management and leadership. I thought I'd just, I'd just keep going on being an engineer and, you know, kind of manage some people on the side or whatever. And uh, that didn't work out for me very well. And so I had to very quickly um, learn how to, how to be a leader and how to manage a team rather Influence. than, yeah. And, um, and then I had a, a stint through structured problem solving, Lean, and then later Six Sigma, and how to use those frameworks to solve big, hairy problems in organizations, and then went into organizational customer uh, support leadership. And so I had, you know, a huge department in Tier 2 and Tier 3 and uh, professional services and, and all of this, and then... I discovered along that way customer experience as a discipline, right? And that was the missing piece that put together structured problem solving and customer support and empathy and emotional intelligence and how do we put the customer at the center and drive that organizational change. And um, so I got an opportunity to do that at a strategic level at the company that I was at. And we, uh, my, my small team and I had some great successes, made the company a lot of money, won an international award. And then you may have heard about this thing we had called the global pandemic. And yeah. in the midst yeah. of the yeah. global pandemic, like seeing, uh, you know, being in love with customer experience and having all of the success and then the global pandemic reshaping I, my ideas, my personal ideas about stability and security and everything. So that was one thing. And then the second thing is it opened up the world of remote work. I had never wanted to be a consultant because I didn't want to travel 50 weeks a year. But now that the pandemic forced this idea of remote work on the world, um, coming out of the pandemic in 2021, I saw, hey, there's an opportunity to take a risk that I'd always wanted to take and be able to do it remotely from my house. And, uh, and, and why not? So in 2021, I quit my job. I started a company, had a baby uh, all at the same time. And, um, yeah, here I am two, two years later. <laughs> so you build these beautiful graphic design journey maps, mm -hmm. and then do you hand those off to internal teams? How do these maps come to life? Well, the last step in our process is to act, right? If you make the map and you don't do anything, it's just a catastrophic waste. So yes, we work with the internal team to plan out what, what are the actions we're going to take to either solve this problem or pursue this opportunity. And then um, my company can either step back and let the internal teams run with it. We can facilitate in that transition. We can start talking about how to how to shift from journey mapping into journey management and, you know, how are we going to run with this thing? What listening posts do we need? Culture change for the organization. I mean, you know, the whole spectrum of customer experience. Management. There's a lot of tentacles in those journey maps that you have to deal with. Uh -huh. Do you, do you think that all journey maps are equal or do you feel like, 
because you mentioned they're all different. Mm -hmm. And I talk, to a, I talk to a lot of people who do journey mapping. I do them myself. I feel like I agree with you that, no, first of all, no two journey maps are the same. But are all journey maps equal? Or do you think there's a good, better, best journey map? Um, I think there's five things you need to have on your journey map. Okay. And I think that if you... And what are those? Uh, uh, number one is it's got to have a customer. There's no customer on the map. It's not a customer journey map. Number two, it's got to tell you what the customer's goal is. What do they want to accomplish in this journey? And then three, it's got to have the interactions that they go through attempting to accomplish that goal, walking through the journey. Four is the emotions that they're feeling. Again, this is all from the customer's perspective, not the company's perspective. So what's the, what's the customer feeling and thinking as they go through this journey? And then lastly, what are the moments of truth? What are those, those critical interactions in the journey that have a disproportionate impact on the customer's experience and ultimately the customer's loyalty to the brand? And then you take those moments of truth and you operationalize them, you tune them. Sure. Or you may find opportunities to add new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be a friction point that's a problem we need to fix. Or it could be an opportunity that you know, we need to, to understand, systematize, and replicate and repeat. Both, both the good and the bad, right? I want to capture this. In your, in your experience with journey mapping, do you find, and because we've agreed that they're all different, mm -hmm. do, would, and you have these five things, do you find that um, there's one or two things that all companies do in their journey maps or they all don't do? All um, is, a, is a tricky word. <laughs> Right, fair, like fair. All, always or never. Well, there's nothing that's always or never. What I see a lot, um, that, you know, as 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 I've gotten to peek behind the scenes, judging award ceremonies, and you know, some of the other stuff that um, we do, is I see a lot of journey maps that are made without really going in depth with customers. It's made on the the company's internal opinions, imagination of what <laughs> they think customers experience. It's so true. And um, there, there can be some value in that, but it's not a customer journey map. You know, let's call it something different, a life cycle map or a touch point diagram, right? And, and, and we actually do some of that in the process of creating the customer journey map because that helps us decide sure. what to talk to customers about when we go in and do the in-depth interviews, which is, is part of the way that my company approaches it. Um, but yeah, if you've got a journey map, but you didn't talk to any customers, then at best it's a hypothesis. I did a, I did a journey map for a international restaurants chain once, and part of it was because it was a restaurant, they have day parts. Mm -hmm. So one of the exercises I did was I took the day, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., so I, like the general hours of operations. And I took the owner operators and I put them in a group and I said, let's put um, uh, post-it notes here of what your customer does Eat at each day, part of the day. Good. And then I uh, took an, another post and I covered them all up. And then I brought in a bunch of customers and I had them tell me what they're doing during that day. And then I brought the owner operators back and we just lifted up the answers to see how many of them matched. And that's exactly what you're talking about is there needs to be in this process a way to calibrate the customer and the operations. And, and that even what I just said, I think is too far of a reach. But <clears throat> you can't begin to calibrate if you don't know where the 
the misalignments are, I right. think. And so I yeah. think that's kind of what you're saying. Uh huh. And, and that's so important for the change management right. at the end. Because I, I don't do like the done for you model, right? Where give me some money, I'll go out and do this thing, and then I'll come back and show you a map. It, it doesn't work. It's not going to drive change because they haven't been on that journey, right? When, when, when I finally show you the map, I want you to have helped create the hypothesis. I want you to have observed customer interviews. I want you to have said with your voice what you heard from customers so that when you finally see the map, you've been on this journey and you see the map and you're saying, yes, yes, that is showing what I have learned on this, this process journey. I love that you said that. You call it the done for you. I call it the birthday present. <laughs> I don't want to wrap this thing up and give it to you and then have you open it and wait to see if you like it. That's not the exercise here. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's an actual uh, collaborative co-creation of an understanding from which the team should be able to extend the understanding outward. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the other things I'd like to hear your take on this as a practicing professional is, one of the other things I find is in the very beginning, before we even get to mapping, whoever's on the team, because, you know, as consultants, we don't pick who gets to show up in that first room. But from the first room, what I do is I take the org chart <clears throat> and I figure out where they are on the org chart. And anywhere that somebody has a misaligned incentive, I go, I say, we have to bring in the supervisor, manager, leader, director, VP that's above these two misaligned incentives because as long as this group and that group don't have a common incentive or a compromised incentive, they'll always pull in different directions. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? Um, very similarly. Uh, and, and I work with, you know, whoever the champion is, whoever's brought me in, we work to understand who are all the stakeholders in this project. And I break stakeholders into five groups. Okay. okay. The first is your executives. They need to champion this initiative. They need to talk about it. They don't have to understand all of the components, right? But they, they need to be aware that it's going on and champion it in the organization. Second type of stakeholders is your gatekeepers. These are the people that control, you know, my client, my champions, access to time, money, and people. If we need Lincoln, who's the very busy business intelligence analyst, right, and Lincoln doesn't do anything unless his boss approves it, his boss is now a gatekeeper. We can't be successful without Lincoln, so we can't be successful without influencing Lincoln's boss to allow us to have some of his time. Third type of stakeholders is your contributors. These are the people that are actually involved. The SMEs we're going to pull into that hypothesis workshop as we're, you know, building out what we think the journey is and what we think is important. After contributors are the influencers. These are the people in the organization that hold sway over the acceptance or the perception of the results. Maybe an executive, may not be an executive. Maybe that guy who's been here for 15 years and everybody, you know, thinks he hung the moon. But who are those people that when they see the final map are going to say, oh, that's not right. Or if we're, if we're doing qualitative research, who are the people who are going to say, Oh, I don't trust qualitative research. You know, it's not statistically significant. That's a whole conversation we can have. So four is the influencers. Five is the people who are impacted by whatever we're about to do. They have to go on this journey too. They can't just, you know, be shown a map someday and say, okay, now we're going to do something differently because, you know, we made this map. They're going to be impacted by whatever change. They need to also see some of their fingerprints over uh, what we're doing. They need to have that customer empathy yeah. and be involved in the change. It's a team sport. I yes. mean, the bottom line is it, customer experience is a team sport. 
in your um, in your description, you said that it has to have a customer, um, and and I would I I, I totally agree with that. <clears throat> Do all journey maps or just some journey maps need the agents or the front lines? The front, where do the front lines fit into the journey map? Um, as far as being depicted on the map, like help, help me understand your question. Yeah, maybe I'm thinking about depicted or accounted for. And as I was asking you, I was trying to ask myself the question mm -hmm. also, which is if I'm thinking about a journey map, I, I suddenly was like some gears were running in my head. I was thinking, does every business have a front line? Uh, waitress, call center agent, mm -hmm. bank teller. Does every business have a front line? And then I was wondering, you know, I, and I'm sort of, because I'm like, uh, uh, I'm homogenizing all of these things I've heard today and I, I continue to hear, and so much we've heard about the employee experience and right. this idea of our, um, essence of CX is so much around the customer, but there's been a lot of discussion about the, the front line is really where the customer is perceived mm -hmm. and, and engages. And so sometimes I think we might have in the past thought about touch points as mm -hmm. intersections with the brand and that this centricity, I think that there is uh, maybe a, a recent conversation in the last year about the centricity is like this yin and yang of mm -hmm. the front lines and the customers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would just, I was reaching for a, a, a way for us to have a conversation about that. So yeah. I, I don't know if I have a real question, but am so, I making any sense to you at all? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as far as the map goes, right, I think those five things we talked about are yes. non-negotiable. You can put a bunch of other stuff on there. You can put improvement opportunities. You can turn it into a service blueprint where now you've got, you know, your front stage and your backstage, what the company is doing to cre create or enable or serve at those touch points. Um, you can put metrics on there. That's awesome. I love it when we begin to get data and analytics on a, on a journey map. At the end of the day, you want to make sure you're telling a story and solving whatever problem or opportunity you set out to solve. So, you know, can you put agents on there and their interactions? Absolutely, if that's what helps guide the organization. I'm asking philosophically because we talk about this. Can a journey map be successful? without the front lines represented anywhere? If in, in so much as you want your journey map to create empathy for the customer and catalyze change in the organization, then it should be all about the customer. You know, back to your original point, which is they're all different. Yeah. And, and I think if we continue to, we could, sit around dinner and talk about this forever. But yeah. the bottom line is a journey map doesn't have to have 600 things on it. It could be, it could be the five things you described. And if, if people just put the five things on it you described and had the, the five stakeholders you were talking about, you could ignite change. And I think you started out by talking about this, this tool that helps make positive change mm -hmm. within an organization. And you can depict positive change as efficiency or profitability. Mm -hmm. You probably could attach other sentiments to it. But at the end of the day, if I'm, I'm, I'm understanding you, you're a champion of the visualization of a customer experience as a way to improve a business. Absolutely, absolutely. What, what, uh, what, do you, what are you thinking about in 2024? Journey Map's gonna stay the same, they gotta get more discipline, are there gonna be advancements? What's your vision for 2024 for journey mapping? Um, 
my vision for 2024 is to grow my my company. Right now, there's me. There's some subcontractors. Um, my vision in 2024 is to expand the what I'm I'm calling the uh, Dharma method as the best practice for journey mapping, and and grow my company. And uh, I want to I want to begin to bring on full time employees and do more maps and help more companies grow profitably by serving the needs of their customers. What do you? Uh... What advice do you have for anyone else, any executive out there who's thinking about getting journey mapping done? What's your advice for them? Um, to, to do it, right? You, so start out with who's your customer. That, that might be very simple if you're a SaaS startup and you're targeting, you know, hospital CFOs. Okay, great. Hospital CFOs. Um, working with a global energy brand right now that has, who's their customer? Well, distributors and franchise owners and the consumer who's buying energy and fleets and aviation, right? All those different customers have different needs, different goals, different brand promise. So to your executive, understand who's your customer, what's the brand promise, and then map their journey. And then after that, you'll know where to invest your limited resources to make the biggest impact on, on your company. All right, well, very sound advice. Dave, thank you for taking time to be on the podcast. I always appreciate having guests. And the I very rarely speak to people who are actually right there with their, their sleeves rolled up doing the work. So thank you for being on the show. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hopefully today's exploration with CX in the wild has unearthed fresh CX insights for you. Be sure to explore previous episodes or share this podcast to invite others on our safari. Have a great suggestion or want to be on the show? Reach out to Dennis on LinkedIn. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring the wild world of CX.